There is no fear, cause I believe There is no doubt, cause I have seen Faithfulness, my fortress And over and over I have a hope found in your name I have a strength found in your grace Your faithfulness, my footprint And over and over Make way through the waters Walk me through the fire Do what you are famous for what you are famous for Shut the mouths of lions Bring dry bones to life And do what you are famous for What you are famous for I believe in you God, I believe in you Yeah, 
to lift our praises and our worship to the one who gave it all for us. So undeserving of this, but you gave it all. And we're thankful. And we're free because of it. So we are free to worship. Nothing should hinder our worship to you. 
today we pray this and we're thankful for who you are come on can you take a couple seconds and just express and open your heart to the Lord if he has been good to you if he has been faithful to you you have a reason to praise him come on take a moment church
Good morning, River of Life family. It's so good to see you. It's Palm Sunday today. And Jesus wasn't the only one with a triumphant entry today. Nobody rode in on a donkey. Y'all walked in here. Y'all look good. And I'm so glad you're here. And any new people in the house, we're just so happy to see you. We're so glad you're here. And when we saw you, this is exactly how we felt. All right, family. Now, Good Friday is this Friday. And I know y'all had so much history about Corwin and his childhood. I got one more thing to tell you. Good Friday, when I was a kid, this is kind of how Good Friday went down. Good Friday was just it. There was nothing else. There was no other Friday plans. There was no other Friday activities. My folks always tell you, we don't care about your little friends. You're going to go into the house of God. You're going to sit down and you're going to act like you got some sense. Now, meanwhile, it went on forever and ever. And can you imagine a young child sitting there and you hot and you might even have to go to the bathroom, but you can't get up because mom and daddy already gave you the speech and they looking at you saying, you better not act up. You better not embarrass me in the house of God. I, I swear for God, you better not do it. And all you can do is sit there and that's what we did we sat there all night long y'all we're gonna have y'all for about an hour y'all get to worship god god's gonna come in and bless you and then y'all can go on home and then you go play with your little friends or go do what you need to do amen be here in this house we're gonna see you i'm gonna be looking for you we all gonna be looking for you jesus is gonna be looking for you all right family so the big day is coming up and we want to talk about easter and we have a few housekeeping rules number one rule Y'all had a whole year to plan it, and I'm telling you now, which gives you a whole week, be on time. 
try to be on time. We're expecting so many guests to come walking through those doors and we don't want any extra distractions because we got our folks from our family rolling in here 15 to 20 minutes late. So if you can be here a little early, if y'all gotta stop hanging with your little friends Saturday night, go ahead and cut it short this week, all right? Next week, you're off the hook. All right, family, rule number two. Everybody got one invite card. Now, y'all said that y'all were gonna give out your one invite card, and I'm not talking about give it to your kid who lives in your house. We talking about invite somebody to get them in the house of God. We're hoping, we're believing, and we're trusting that you're gonna do what you're supposed to do and give out your one invite card. That's all you had to do. Now, that leads me to rule number three, all right? You gave your card out, and because you did what you were supposed to do, we're gonna ask that you all park in the back. Now, we have it all taken care of. It's right here on the screen. Shows you exactly where to go. Now, because you did what you were supposed to do, y'all said y'all were going to do it. You gave out your one car, which means that this parking lot is going to be full. All right? It's going to be full because God is going to come down and rain down that manna from heaven, and it's just going to overflow, and we're just going to feel the anointing in this house, and it's going to tear the roof off this place. And, and, and I know, I know, I'm not going to do it. We're not going to do it. I'm not going to go there. We're not going to bring him back. He had enough time last week and the week before. We're not gonna bring him back because y'all got the message. So we're asking that you park in the back just to give a little space for all the guests that are gonna come in. Just take a, it's a little extra, a few extra steps, a few extra steps. We have baptisms on Easter Sunday. And I know this is a big deal for a lot of folks and we're hoping that you know, you're know you listening to the Lord and the Lord is speaking to you. And if you decide to make that step, you decide to proclaim openly all the things that God is doing for you, we encourage you to do it on Easter Sunday. And what better day than the day that Jesus rose, the day that Jesus got up and you going down in that water an old creature and you coming up a new creature. Isn't that amazing? And y'all know we do BBBs here biblically based baptisms. You won't catch us doing any of the weird stuff like this. So you got one more week to sign up. We can't wait to baptize you in Jesus name. All right, online family. It's an awesome week for you. And when you think of the greatest of all time, the GOAT, what do you think of? Some of y'all think about LeBron James. Some of y'all think about Michael Jordan. Some of y'all think about Tom Brady. This one brother told everybody he was the greatest of all time. I told you all that I was the greatest of all time. Now, when I think of the greatest of all time, I think about Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Y'all know. Y'all know. I know y'all hooping and hollering back there. Don't kick your foot on that table because it's going to hurt. We're starting a new series called The Sermon on the Mount, The Greatest of All Time, brought to you by Jesus Christ, The Greatest of All Time. But y'all about to hear it from one of the greatest pastors of all time, right here at the River of Life House. And we're not talking about, you know, when we say greatest of all time, we're not just talking about all oh, some random smojo. We're not talking about a billy goat. We're talking about the greatest of all time, Pastor Dale Donatio. Come on, y'all, give him a little love because he's coming to bring us an amazing word. Today, we're gonna start with Matthew chapter five. And uh, um, we're going to look at just three verses today, but there is one word that um, we're going to look at that really bleeds throughout Christ's sermon when he's talking to people in Matthew chapter five, verses one through three. The question that Jesus begins to answer is this, are you a happy person? And this is what he throws out there. The word that he uses is blessed. When you look at Matthew chapter 5, the word in the Greek is makairos, and it means happy many times over. You know, it's comforting and interesting to note that when we come to the first full-length sermon of Jesus Christ, he is concerned about our happiness. And I say that because often people think that God is against people being happy. It's almost like those who don't know God or even those who have been in the church and maybe had bad teaching, um, bad exegesis that is, that is in the text, that they think that God wants us to be miserable. 
or that God is, a, is one who wants to take all fun um, out of li living. Many times they go back to the Ten Commandments and we have seen that the Ten Commandments bring life. And he brought the Ten Commandments to us to protect us. Again, to have happiness. Listen, the whole reason why Jesus came to this earth was so that we might have joy and know joy and know the fullness of life. In fact, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So, so what he is saying is, here is when we know who God is, when the Spirit of God is active in our lives, there is going to be a fullness of life. There is going to be a freedom. There is going to be a peace that is in our life that passes all of our understanding. Life is not something that you and I have to endure. Even though God calls us to take up the cross and follow him. And we're going to talk about that, not today, but in the messages to come of what that looks like and what that means. How can we take up the cross that God has called us to bear and still have a happiness in our life? Still be full of happiness. This is something that the enemy wants to rob from us. In fact, in John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief comes only, and he's speaking of the, the enemy here, the devil, the thief comes only to steal and, and kill and destroy. But then Jesus says, there's something different about me. There is a reason why I came to this earth. There's a reason why I died on the cross, why I rose again. I came that you may have life, that you may have happiness, that you may have joy. And he says, have it abundantly. So Jesus Christ is concerned about our quality of life. There are two kinds of happiness that we're going to see um, in part of this, this, this sermon, this Sermon on the Mount. First, there is a happiness that is achieved independently. So what I mean by that, it's based on our associations. It's based on how much money we have on, in the bank. It's based on our talents, our giftings. It's based day to day on our circumstances. So, so there is a measure of happiness that comes to us because basically of where we are at in life. Maybe when we were a teenager, we were in our early 20s, we did not have that much responsibility. We were more carefree. And so it seemed like life was better. That we had happiness. Then comes along responsibilities, monthly bills, children, spouses, different situations at work. And all of a sudden, pressure. All of a sudden, this word uh, responsibility. And, and, and then it seems like maybe that has stole our happiness or our joy. Now, it's very easy, we all know, to be happy when everything has fallen into place. There's no bumps in our lives or in the journey that we are on. But here's the problem. When things don't fall our way, when things don't go our way, when we thought something should happen and it didn't happen, then we're no longer happy. Then life becomes a, a roller coaster and we live that way. Life then is not consistent. And when we are not consistent internally, we are not happy. That definition of happiness embezzles peace. It embezzles contentment. It steals. It robs. It destroys. Jesus comes though and and turns our thinking upside down as he preaches this, this 
phenomenal message. And he says, happiness is not based on what happens to you. There is a divine happiness. And he begins to explain this, this, this supernatural happiness uh, that leads to a sense of well-being, that leads to a sense of contentment, of joy, regardless of our surroundings, regardless of our circumstances. And he knows that we all want happiness. We all want happiness. We all want and desire God to set up the stages of our life and walk through those. We all desire favor. The favor of God. We know that the Bible says God's not going to leave us. He will not forsake us. The psalmist said this in Psalm 71 too, In your righteousness... He says, because of who you are, God, deliver me, help me. Let my joy turn to gladness, rescue me, incline your ear to me, save me, help me. And so he's talking about the life and all the things that come our way in life. And the psalm that says, listen, I need to have your joy. I need to have your contentment. I want to live life the way you want me to walk. And Jesus says to the psalmist, to those that he's speaking to when he's preaching this message, and to us today, as we're listening to what he says, he says, Dale, okay, if that's what you want, if you want happiness in life, here is the recipe. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Happy are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Happy many times over are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Happy many times over are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Happy are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. There's the recipe. From the greatest of all time. From the goat. As he preaches the word to them, to us. And as we absorb what he just said. I mean, I imagine those that were in the audience that day begin to scratch their head, begin to, I mean, it went against everything that they were taught. And, 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 and they, they thought this cannot be true. And maybe you're here and you read this. That word blessed, like I said, means happy in the Greek, happy many times over. And you're thinking, well, this does not make sense. It actually sounds like a recipe for misery. For depression. For, for me just wanting to coil up in a little ball and, and not come out of my room. So what's interesting is that word blessed is used in the scripture of God himself. So, so he's saying, I want you to enjoy the exact same kind of happiness that I enjoy because I love you. Because I care for you. Because I died on the cross for you. I rose again for, for you to have this happiness. For you to have this joy that's unspeakable and full of my glory. In fact, in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And what? I am life. I am life. I am happiness. I am joy. I am comfort. I am peace. This is who I am. No one can come to me except through the Father. 
So when you do that and I do that and we give our life to him, all of a sudden there is that joy that is unspeakable. There is that happiness that comes into life. He said again in Matthew 6, 33, I want you to have happiness and fulfillment in life. So seek first the kingdom of God. Seek me Seek my presence, who I am, and my righteousness, my character. And then life is going to bring fulfillment. Life is going to bring happiness. You are going to enjoy life regardless of your circumstances. That's what he says. And all these things, what? Will be added to what? To your life, to your mindset, to your thinking, to your heart. You say, well... Dale, how do I possess this happiness? Well, inside this phenomenal sermon, the greatest sermon that has ever preached, what theologians call the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are our lifeline that will raise the standard of living whereby we can know the fullness of joy in Christ Jesus. Listen. When we embrace God's values, they become our happiness. That's something to write down, just in case you wanted to know. When we embrace God's values, they become our happiness. God loves us. God cares for us. God desires this for us. So in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, seeing the crowds, seeing the people, Jesus went up on the mountain and he sat down and he began to teach. In Matthew 4, 25, it says, and great crowds, thousands upon thousands of people followed Jesus from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and even from beyond the Jordan to hear him teach. Jesus could never, and I, want, I wanted you to see this, because Jesus could never get away from the crowds. They, they were constantly following him. Constantly. And, and as he turns and sees all their faces, I really want us to get an idea of what was going through his mind as he begins to preach this sermon. Look at it in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. When he saw the people, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Why? Because he knew what they were walking through. He knew what was going on in their hearts. He knew their fears, their anxieties, their, their doubts. He, he knew their sadness. In other words, he cared about the emotional mindset of the people. He cared. And so he had compassion. Why? They're, they were harassed. They were helpless. The leaders, sadly, of that day were cared only about themselves and really didn't care about the people. Jesus said, I have compassion on their emotions because they're, they're like sheep without a shepherd. No one really wants to shepherd. You know, being a pastor, you have to love people. All people. And we are called to be like the great shepherd, aren't we? We are called to be like the greatest of all time, which is Christ, which is, which is God himself. We have to love people. And so, I want you again to get his, what he is, is thinking here. So he is moved with compassion. And every time he sees us, he is moved with compassion. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 13, now Jesus heard this. He withdrew there in a boat to a desolate place trying to get alone. But when the people heard that he was trying to get alone by himself, they still followed him on foot from town to town. And when he was at a, sh a shore and he saw the great crowd, he saw people. He had compassion on them and he healed them. 
So not only does he see them and have that emotional sensitivity, he sees them and he sees them physically sick, tired, emotionally sick, spiritually sick. And he comes and he still heals. He still cares. He still loves. This is our God. He wants to bring joy and happiness and fulfillment. In Matthew chapter 15, 32, Jesus called his disciples and said, watch this again. I have compassion on people. I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and they have not even eaten. I mean, we can barely get through 45 minutes and you're thinking of, of, of the chicken and, and the, the steaks and all that to get out of here, to eat, to get to the restaurants. Three days. And watch this. I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. I mean, you know when you don't eat, you don't sleep mentally, we're not all there. So Jesus knows this. He knows the condition of the body. He's concerned with, with, with not only the physical, the emotional, but also the, the mental aspect of the crowd. And so he begins in Matthew 5, verse 1, seeing the crowds, he goes up on the mountain. And when he sat down and came to them, he opened up his mouth and taught them. So every time he sees the crowd, he's moved with compassion. He is our source. He is our foundation. And Jesus reviews the condition of our hearts today and our lives. And he says to River of Life Church, I want to give you some truth. That, that will help you take your life to a new level of living. A new level of living. And he says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You say, well, what is that about? Well, there are two words in the Greek for poor. When it says blessed are the poor, the first in the Greek is Pentecost. And this word was used for people who did not have much. Now, they're not totally destitute. They still had something. You know, the widow who came to Christ and she had, what, two pennies. That is, in that context, she was Pentecost poor. She, she was not, did not have anything. She had something, but she gave it. Then there's another word that's used in scripture when it relates to poor and it's the word is tokos. And, and this word is used of someone who was totally destitute. They had absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. No resources at all. Not even two pennies to their name. Jesus is saying, blessed are those, and the word he uses for poor there is tokas, blessed are those who have absolutely nothing. That's odd. You say, Dale, so are we talking about uh, those that are totally destitute? They don't have a home. They don't have um, any money in the bank, they're homeless, they have nothing. That, is that what we're talking about when Jesus says poor? Well, there are some who say yes. That's what Jesus is talking about. But, but there is a, that there is a blessing. There is a happiness to those who have absolutely nothing. Now, that does not make a lot of sense. If that was true, then the worst thing we could do for someone who was poor would be to give them something. Right? To give them food, to give them a home, to give them a car, to give them money. I mean, if God's intentions, uh, if, if this was God's intention, the best thing we could do would be able that would be then to take things from people. Because then they would be happy. So if you want to, to, to just after service, give me your car, write me a check. I will take everything from you and you can give it to me so you could be happy <laughs> and blessed. It's ridiculous, right? 
I mean, it doesn't, that doesn't make sense. And the reason it doesn't make sense is because that's not what Jesus was talking about at all. Jesus is not referring here to material possessions. Blessed are the poor in spirit is all about how you and I view ourselves. How do you view yourself? Jesus said, blessed are those when they begin to evaluate themselves, recognize that they have absolutely nothing in and of themselves. So the peace of happiness goes completely the, against our culture. And, and it went against their culture and, and same today. Because culture says, blessed is the one who has everything. Blessed is the one, happy is the one, when they look at themselves, think they're all that. That they have so much confidence, they're self-assured. They, they believe so much in their own identity and who they are and what they can do. Our culture says happy is the one who has a lot of friends, a lot of money, a lot of education, a lot of talents. Fulfilled is the one who, 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 who gets, who has. And Jesus, as he's preaching, comes and says, no. No, that's, that's not it at all. That's not how I created mankind. That's not how I put together the fabric of, 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 in society that brings fulfillment. He says, happy, blessed, fulfilled, content is the person who actually has none of those things. It's as if Jesus is telling us that is not where happiness is rooted. We all hear this, and it's so difficult to come to terms with, with this truth. We don't find internal, satisfying, constant happiness in things we possess. We find it when we admit and accept that we are poor, we're tokas poor, in spirit. And then we begin to actually live that way. We begin to treat people that way. We begin to have a greater understanding. In other words, we strive to come to a place of total dependence upon God. And that's what he's saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the people who are totally dependent upon God. Me. And that's a good, good thing because in 2 Corinthians 3.17, as we read before, where the spirit of the Lord is. When the spirit of the Lord is dominating our thinking, dominating our life, when we realize we are nothing without him, we can't live without the spirit. He says, when you come to that place, there is freedom. There's joy, there is life. So we say, Lord, there is nothing in me that really is that great unless you use it, unless you lead me, unless I have the right mindset when I take myself out of the picture. And isn't that the heart of what the psalmist was saying? God, I need you. God, save me, help me. Rescue me. I, I can't do this alone. I cannot do life without you. I just, I just can't do it. And Jesus is asking us to come to a place where we leave self behind. Where we say, it's only what you do. It's only where you are working that it is actually going to bring fulfillment and joy. And it's finally going to come together where I, when I learn to truly be dependent upon you. Where I truly learn that I am poor in my spirit. I am tokas poor. I have nothing unless the spirit of God is living in me. And not just living in me. If he is, it must be producing something. 
It has to produce. It has to make a difference. We can't just live life and say the Spirit of God is in us and every situation that happens, we operate in the flesh instead of in the Spirit. If that is not happening, then something is wrong. In Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15, watch this. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up. Who is that? Jesus, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is contrite and lowly. Here's that again, that that phrase, lowly in spirit. Those who are poor in spirit. I dwell in with the person who is totally dependent upon me. This is what I this is what he's saying. And what do I do? I revive the spirit. I revive the person who finally realizes I can't do anything without you. I just can't do it. I mean, isn't it true life is hard? Isn't it? I mean, it's tough. It's hard. And God says, listen, but, but, but when someone is tokos poor, when someone is poor in spirit, I will revive the spirit of the lowly. I will revive the heart of the contrite. In Judges chapter 7 and verse 2, you say, why is this such a big deal to God? Why does he want us to be so dependent upon him? Because he knows us. He knows we fight the flesh. He knows we, we want to be bigger and better and we want people to, to look at us and think that we have all the answers, that we're all that because of what we drive or what we have or how smart we are. He knows that's a trap. He realizes that. And so in Judges 7, 2, the Lord says to Gideon, listen, the people with you are too many, he says to Gideon. You're still too confident in and of yourself. He says, listen, to give the Midianites into your hand and and, and Israel will boast over me saying, my own hand has saved me. That's why I need you to have less. Right? He dropped down the warriors and he says, listen, why? Because I need the glory, Gideon, not you. If you get the glory, you're going to fail. But when I get the glory, you will succeed. Are you seeing it? This is what he is saying. He says, this will bring you fulfillment, Gideon. And he's saying to all of us here, to me, Dale, this will bring you fulfillment. When you, when you think this way, when you live this way, I want you to come to a place where you have total dependence on me so that when I work, Dale, when I work in your life, when, when Easter comes and there's three services that, that are standing room only and, and we have 50 or 100 people come to know Jesus Christ where people are set free, that I'm not going to say, wow, what a message I preached. Look at how God is, man, I am just, I am all that and this wouldn't have happened without the hard work of me and all my staff and no way. No way. He says, Dale, I want you to be dependent on me so that when I work, and I will, in your life, people will see the true source. I am working and you need to work every single day where they don't see you, they don't see Dale Donatio, they see the glory of God. And God then gets the glory and not us. Are you following me? So we need to work to be tokas poor. Blessed, happy are the poor in spirit. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 9, Jesus is telling a parable to some who trusted in themselves. In other words, they didn't understand dependency. They thought they were righteous. And they, because they thought they were all that, because they didn't learn to be dependent upon God, they treated other people poorly. 
When we are not totally dependent on God, we are going to want to take care of ourselves, our own emotions, our own heart. And God says, no, you need to put that aside and you need to look at the people. You need to have compassion, both for the physical, for the spiritual, for the emotional, for the mental. Do you see people? Are you following me? Jesus is saying that, and he tells a complete parable. He does a little sermon illustration here. He says, let me tell you a story. Two men went up into the temple, into the church, and prayed. One guy, I know it says Pharisee. One, or preacher, there's one preacher and one, one sinner, basically. One who knows God and one who doesn't. And that's what a tax collector would be. So now as I continue to read, you think of this. Jesus says there's one Christian, and let's pretend one one atheist, or one person who just doesn't care about God. So the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Extortioners, unjust, man, they're sleeping around, or even like these people that are tax collectors, and they they basically just care about money. They're stealing from people. I... I fast twice a week. I give 10% of all my income. The, the, but but, but the, the tax collector, standing afar off, wanted to go all the way in the back, didn't even feel worthy to come towards the temple, would not even lift up his eyes toward heaven, but he beat his body saying, God, something's happening. I feel your presence. I'm not worthy to even be in this church. That's how I feel. That's not true, but that's how I feel. Can you be merciful to me? I'm, I'm lost. I don't know you. I'm a sinner. Can you just help me? Jesus said, I tell you this. The man who went down to his house justified, speaking of the sinner, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts, this is key, exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles themselves, the one who is poor in spirit, the one who is tokos poor, I will exalt them. Here's a question for all of us in everyday life. Do people see you on Monday, on Tuesday? Do people see you in hard situations when you're struggling, when you're down and out, when you're going through circumstances that are beyond your control? Do they see you or do they see Jesus in you? Are you following me? Jesus begins to preach the greatest message of all time and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That is our goal. I mean, this principle on relying on God is foundational. When, when, when we come to Christ, isn't it true we come to him based on that? I mean, he could, he could do what he could do in us. When we come to Christ, he could do in us not what we could do for ourselves. So we couldn't do it. He had to do it. That is really what Christianity is based on. That is what salvation is based on, is what God does. We don't, we don't petition God with an argument claiming I'm a good person. And so I'm a good person. That means I am saved, that I am redeemed because I'm good. There is no good in and of ourselves. And and God says, well, you're right. You're a pretty good person. So come on in. I'm going to save you. I died on the cross for you and you're good. So, so that's good enough. Now, the, not my opinion, but the Bible says that is not how it works. We don't gain salvation. We don't get to heaven until we realize there is nothing we could do that would earn that salvation, right? 
I mean, in, 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 if he, in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in this, accepts this, should not perish but have an eternal life. Ephesians chapter two and verse eight, for it is by grace, by God's grace you are saved through faith and this is not of your own doing. It's not because you're good. This is a gift from God, not a result of works so that no one can then boast. Why? Because we have to be dependent upon God. If we're not dependent on God, then we boast. And then it's about us. And, and God becomes a, like a, a, a cell phone to our hip and when we need it, we call. But no, there's work to do when we accept Jesus Christ. Now, we have to realize you came, Christ came, he lived, he paid the price of sin, he died and he rose. And because of him, we are able to live. That is exactly what Jesus then is talking about and referring to in Matthew chapter 5. Until there is total dependence upon me, you will never experience complete happiness. Dale, you're striving so hard to prove yourself to me. You're doing everything in your own power. And God says, that's not what I am looking for. Well, Dale, doesn't scripture say, because there's a lot of lazy Christians out there, doesn't, Christian, doesn't the Bible say God helps those who help themselves? No. I mean, it's not even in the Bible. The word of God says he helps people who can't help themselves. God carries those who come to him that are at the end of their rope. And that's who he is. And he says, listen, when you realize that, and it's not just because of a situation, but you have that mentality in life. Because in reality, we are always at the end of our rope. Because we have to depend on him. We can't do a day without him. And so God says, this is how you have to live. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Church, when we come to the, when we come to the end of ourselves, that is when we truly begin to live. Why? Because then we, be, we come to the beginning of God and the spirit. You know, I remember... Just in my own personal life, when, when uh, you know, I came, uh, I was getting ready to, to come to this church a long, long time ago, but um, I thought growing up as a missionary's kid and was going into to, to, to law and, um, you know, I had a wrong perception about who God is. And, and what God does in a person's life. And I thought because of my education, because of who my dad was, he knew a lot of people within our movement, within the, and we are Assembly of God, he knew a lot of different people. When I decided the Lord didn't want me to, to go the direction of law and I went into the ministry, I actually thought, that because of my resources, my things that were around me, that things were just going to fall in place because of people I knew. And I interviewed at this church in, in um, Naperville, Illinois, as a, for a junior high pastor, junior high youth pastor. The church was a mega church. The, the, the junior high alone had over a little over 400 students. So the pastor there had me interview. I interviewed for three months. I went twice. My wife, I was newly married. She, uh, she's an educator. And even though Angela does worship and she is f worship and writes books and all that, she went to school. She has her music degree, but she was a teacher. So she was teaching. She was a teacher. And she got the job before I got a job as a teacher in the school system there in Naperville. And so I was like, wow, this is God. My dad is best friends with the pastor. They went to school together. And this is, you know, I, I now have my master's of divinity. I should be pastoring 
just junior high at 400 or more. That's bigger than a lot of churches. And that was my mentality. And that pastor called me. It was a, probably a 15 second conversation. Dale, hey, yes, yes, Pastor Schmickall. Um, we're going in another direction. Thank you so much for interviewing. We're going to send you a love offering. God bless you. Pray God's will for your life. Goodbye. I mean, I was devastated. Devastated. I mean, and I, when I look back, and some of you have been in this area for a long time, I mean, when this place 31 years ago, I, I, I just could never imagine that I would be here, ever. That me and my wife would minister in this area. But God had a different, God had to say to me, hey, you are never going to find my will until you learn to become poor in spirit. And that really hit me hard at that time in my life. Have I arrived to always be poor in spirit? Absolutely not. It's going to be a lifelong thing. But after 30 years of ministry, I can tell you this. I am a lot more dependent upon God than dependent upon myself. I have a lot further to go, and so do we all. And that's why God says, listen, this is where I want you to live. Now today, maybe you are right where I was. You don't know what in the world's happening. You are at the end of your rope. Not that you're not a Christian, you love the Lord, but you're learning. Maybe you're at the end of the rope in your business, in your job, with your marriage. Maybe there's, there's a situation of unanswered prayer. You don't know why, and you are literally at the end of your rope. The situation that you're in is so frustrating, and, 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 it, and you're, you're, you're anxious about it. Maybe even fearful because you have done everything you possibly can to fix it. And God says, are you done yet, Dale? Are you done? Maybe you can need another month to do whatever you think you need to do. Do it again. Keep, keep striving. God says, and maybe to some of us today, just like he said to me, can you please, will you please finally trust me? Stop giving me lip service and saying you trust me and worship me and raise your hands and all that kind of stuff. Can you actually live it out? Can you do that? Can you truly be poor in spirit? Will you come to a place of dependence in your walk with me? Listen, there is, and I'm telling you this, not because I said it, but the greatest preacher of all time said it in this sermon. He says, listen, Jesus says, there is a release that comes with that. There is a release in you that comes with dependence. When we embrace God's value, they become our happiness. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The one who says, God, you are actually now truly in control of my life. In Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in Christ. Not that I can do all things, right? And Philippians is the book of what? Joy. Joy. Right? It's the book of happiness. I can do all things through Christ because he is the one that gives me strength. Can, listen, we need to be real with God. We need to be vulnerable with him. Let someone in. Let's get past. We have to get past our hurts past our failures. We have to let go of pride and truly be poor in spirit. And it happens when we embrace God's values, then God's values become our happiness. Then secondly, I want you to see the reward. Look at it. Blessed is the poor in spirit. Watch this. For theirs, when we get 
dependent upon him, theirs is the kingdom of God. Jesus says, when we come to a place of dependence, then we, he says, I now am completely free to work in your life, to work in people's lives that are around you. I am, I am now able to develop my kingdom in your heart, in your life. Doesn't the proverb say this? Keep your heart with all vigilance. Guard that. Guard your heart. Why? Because out of it flows happiness. Out of it flows joy. Out of it flows the wellsprings of life. And who wants to take life from us? We read it earlier. The enemy wants to rob us of happiness. Rob us of life. Rob us of contentment. Rob us of peace. Rob us of all these things that God says, when you are truly dependent upon me, I am going to pour blessings out over you. Amen? Amen. Let me give you some kingdom killers. I can handle it. I got this. I can do it. I don't don't need anyone in this situation. Listen, let's stop putting on this stupid charade of superhero Christian and actually let's get kingdom power into our situation, into our mindset, into our living. Because unless we are dependent upon God, we are only doing what we can do. And what we can do, no matter how smart you are, how great you are, how rich you are, it is only going to get you so far. And it is not going to bring you the happiness spiritually. It is not going to let you begin and me begin to walk in a kingdom mindset. Mindset. God desires obedience from us. And that obedience says, hey, happy is the person who is poor in spirit. For they will have a kingdom mindset. A kingdom mindset is all about God. And so then you enjoy everything that God has. And he has a lot. Because he is God. God. Let me close with some questions here. Three, a couple closing questions that maybe you're thinking and maybe you're not. But why does God open with this? When I was studying this sermon, I, I was, you know, because you, you, you want to catch people's attention, right? If you're a public speaker, you're learning, and those of you that are in D3 or have been in there, you know that I teach this. You know, that, that first 30 seconds is important. Because usually people have to be in their mind. You have to catch their attention. So why does Jesus open with this first? I think it's because it's not until we come to dependence on God that we will see the kingdom of God in our lives. And we have to see the kingdom of God in our lives. Because that's what keeps us going. In, in, a, in a world that wants to destroy us. An enemy who wants to destroy us. Listen, does that mean that I don't have to do anything or any work? No. Letting go, being dependent on God, takes work. It takes work. Philippians 2.12, Therefore, church, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, watch this, Paul says, but much more in my absence. So if I'm just sitting here and I'm with you every day and like, I can't do this, I can't do this. Dale's there. Dale's right there. Pastor's there. Can he get out of my house and get out of my mind? And He's everything. Paul, and he was the pastor then, he says, listen, I'm teaching you. I'm helping you. And, And listen, you can't just, you can't just have this, this tokos poor attitude in church or in life group. Or when pastor's worshiping. You, you, when I'm gone and you're alone with your mind and you're alone with your thoughts and the enemy and the flesh are pounding at you when, there's, when the absence is there, hey, work out your salvation. Go back to the source. Go back to who I am and do it with fear and trembling. you got to be totally dependent for it is God who works in you. 
It's God who does that. Both watch this, to will and to work for his good pleasure. The Lord just may be allowing you to go through your situation because he wants you to be happy. He needs to bring you to the end of yourself to truly know happiness. I know it's not fun, it's not pleasant, you won't like it, but it's the best thing for you to be dependent upon God. Say, Dale, how will I know when when this is working? How will I know when I'm really being dependent upon the Lord? Well, first, we will lose a sense of self-awareness and will become others minded. It's a change from a self-consciousness to a God consciousness. That is the kingdom mindset that God said you'll begin to have. So you're gonna start seeing things differently. You're gonna see people differently, situations differently. You're gonna handle them differently. Second, our love for Jesus will be heightened because he's the most important thing now. Not, not, not other things. We, we will then be careful not to complain about our circumstances because if God's the one who we are depending on, then we know that he is in control and we're going to keep seeking after him. And then we're going to have a passion for prayer. And what did we learn prayer is? Prayer is relationship. And relationship is prayer. So we're going to continue to keep looking after him. We're going to continue to knock. We're going to continue to seek his presence and who he is. And then our hearts are going to begin to be full of thanksgiving. You're going to be going through a situation and it's, it's hard. But for some reason you're like, wow, why is my heart so full? Why is there such thanksgiving? Why am I so grateful? It's, it's supernatural. I want you to stand to your feet. Listen, we are going to...